<laughs> okay, let me start again. Welcome, everybody. <laughs> You've been listening to me. Well, you haven't been listening to me yet on uh, because I've been muted. So welcome to this noon meeting seminar presented by the Division of Public Health Medicine on behalf of Partners in a Collaborative Research Project, which um, uh, is titled uh, uh, COMPLUS, Community Participation in Plural Health Systems. We'll go back to the first slide. Yeah, I'm to... just alerting you that we are going to have load shedding. So when there is load shedding, we will have a small interruption for a few minutes until power comes back. So just bear with us. Um, and as you can see, my colleague from Sao Paulo is busy setting up <laughs> this so it shouldn't collapse when the load shedding goes down. Give us a minute or two. It's going on. Sure. Good. It's good. good. Okay, so uh, this is a collaboration of partners from Sebrape, which is an uh, organization in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, TGI, the George Institute and Spark from India, and uh, UCT's School of Public Health, our Division of Public Health Medicine. It's funded by the Institute of the National Institute of Health Research, UK, and just the persons in the audience need to turn their volume down, <laughs> so it doesn't echo. Um, it's a project looking at participation and pluralization. How do we affect uh, community participation in a context where there's been a substantial growth over the past decades of pluralization of healthcare delivery in Brazil, South Africa, and India? Uh, if you think about uh, participation and pluralization, they share common aims, which are to improve equity, access, uh, quality, and efficiency. Um, but there are different strategies. In participation, we see the strategy of democratizing policy processes and public input into policy processes, whereas in pluralization, it's really about improving managerial capabilities, technical delivery. Participation has its ideological roots, both uh, in political theory and in the, uh, the Alma Ata Declaration and the primary healthcare approach, whereas pluralization has its roots in market ideologies and a reliance on what is possible in practice. And the forms of participation we get, we see uh, hospital boards, health committees, district health councils, and under pluralization, we see uh, essentially contracting of private practitioners under universal health care systems or NHI systems, such as we heard in a previous noon meeting this uh, year to provide obstetric care. And both strategies have strengths and could reinforce this, the community voice in health systems. Um, and if you think about private health systems, you, you put uh, accountable patient care at the center and you have multiple uh, factors which shape uh, that health care. You have contractual relationships, you have private quality assurance systems uh, in South Africa at least and in many other countries, um, health insurance is responsible for uh, private delivery and there are mechanisms within insurance systems to promote accountable quality care and there are obviously regulatory standards. In the context of public health systems, we often have different forms of accountability. We have statutory systems for participation, so the law mandates certain forms of participation. We have quality assurance systems, but under the public sector. We have programs aimed to foster participation often. Uh, and then, particularly for the state, we have human rights entitlement uh, obligations and individual entitlements to human rights claims, which shape accountable patient care. And when you merge them, um, how do you affect that merging of different approaches to participation? So, for instance, uh, how do you integrate private quality assurance and public quality assurance systems? We know in South Africa that the Office of Health Standards Compliance is struggling to do that, even though it's said that it is trying to do so. Um, human rights entitlements and state obligations exist in law and are quite different to contractual relationships. And can you incorporate such human rights entitlements and obligations into contractual relationships? Um, and under, under our current laws in South Africa, there are statutory systems for participations. How do we see those fitting into the contractual relationships with the private sector, for example? And of course, um, medical scheme membership often uh, a way for uh, medical skill members to participate, even if flawed, how do we integrate that when there are population level 
systems for participation. And of course, regulatory standards apply all around and they have to be compatible with human rights entitlements. So you can see it's quite a complex landscape. And this is what we are trying to enter into looking at how is it feasible? How do we affect it? Um, and obviously human rights entitlements also determine the statutory systems for what, what participation. I could probably place a lot of other yellow or red arrows on the diagram indicating its complexity. So <clears throat> the project is, is focused on community participation in plural health systems and considers it a design challenge. Essentially, there are new ways of combining public and private provision that call attention to the actual and potential role of institutionalized channels for community participation in contributing to the effectiveness of a health system. And if states, to whatever extent they can or do, comply with their human rights obligations to ensure meaningful social participation in health, how then do they negotiate extending the purview of these systems to non-state providers? That is essentially what we are asking in this project. So in South Africa, we have two health systems, the public sector overrun, understaffed, the private sector often uh, well-resourced and underserviced, or you know, uh, uh, provider-driven servicing. With uh, so we were interrupted at this point where I was talking about the tale of two health systems, which is very familiar to us in South Africa, and in fact, many parts of the world where the private sector is well-resourced, public sector under-resourced, struggling, uh, needing input. And not moving. Sorry again. Okay. And in South Africa, we are moving towards universal health coverage, as we know, with the idea that uh, national health insurance will um, leave no one behind. Um, but the question is uh, how are we going to affect that in a way that captures the participation elements? So the rationale of this project is really that there's plenty of evidence that community participation can positively impact health systems, notwithstanding many challenges. And I quote here from uh, research done in the Western Cape with health committees where uh, a respondent said, when we as health committee members want to express our opinion as to what is needed in our communities, listen, please listen. So the respondent was talking about the difficulty of being excluded, being ignored by the health system. Uh, secondly, participation in health is also rooted in a human rights framework, uh, which we have seen. At the same time, there's evidence that incorporating private provision in public systems based on UHC could enable quick expansion and improved access to care in peripheral and poor areas of big cities. But there are many pitfalls and cautions. For example, it's been said it introduces a private logic in the public system, and that's an irreconcilable contradiction. So the starting point of this project is that community participation can help foster the alignment of what we understand to be bureaucracies, the politicians, the officials, the health professionals around the goals of improving population health and well-being. But finding adequate mechanisms to integrate uh, participation and pluralization will represent a decisive contribution to strengthen both community participation as it would have a clearer mandate in the implementation process and the contracting processes which are required for pluralization because communities views needs and perceptions of health adequacy would be more adequately incorporated into the contracts so the overall aim of the project is to strengthen the participation and voice of communities and community structures in urban pluralistic health systems for better alignment of health system actors around the common goals of accountable, responsive and inclusive health systems. We are going to employ different methods, landscape analysis, in-depth qualitative research, tracking of selected indicators. Uh, but most importantly, we're going to develop uh, interventions in a co-design process with community partners, build community uh, capacity and service capacity, and then evaluate. You'll see the map with uh, six case studies across three countries. Uh, in South Africa, it's Cape Town and Mabeja. Uh, in India, uh, it's Fortaleza, uh, sorry, Mumbai and Bengaluru. And in Brazil, uh, it's Sao Paulo and Fortaleza. Um, the, there are a set of objectives, broad objectives, which more or less track to different work packages. 
uh, we're going to firstly delineate the policy, institutional and community contexts that mediate effective community participation through urban health committees. And that's going to be a review of the evidence in year one. Uh, secondly, we're going to co-produce specific interventions with marginalized communities and with providers to facilitate participation and community voice. And that will be the work in years one and two around collecting and generating evidence, as well as building collaborative partnerships, co-developing, testing and implementing a participatory approach to a pluralistic health system. We are also then obviously going to evaluate and reflect on the context mechanisms and outcomes of implementation to refine the intervention to strengthen community voice. And that will largely be in the form of a work package related to capacity building, piloting and evaluation. Uh, and lastly, we're hoping that this project will help us learn from different country contexts and foster capacity strengthening of communities, health systems, health system stakeholders and global researchers. And that is obviously the last work package comprising comparison and dissemination. The outcomes we anticipate, which we hope, in the short term, we anticipate new multi-actor networks, both within countries and across countries. And yesterday, our uh, partners from Brazil and India visited some of the community sites that we've been working with in Cape Town. Uh, we anticipate enhanced research capacity from community co-design, including enhanced capacity amongst community activists, health service actors, and young researcher capacity and policy and practice relevant dissemination, including um, outputs related to website, newsletters and publications. In the medium term, we anticipate strengthened community voice and systems of accountability and contracting, enhanced receptiveness of providers and managers, and improved relationships of trust between actors. And in the long term, we're hoping for a more inclusive health system, which will provide structured and meaningful opportunities for communities to voice their input to decision making especially where there are these plural health systems evolving. So I'm going to now hand over to my colleague, Vera de Culo from uh, Brazil, from Sao Paulo, who's going to talk to the Brazilian health system context. So, hello everyone. It's really nice to be here today. I will briefly present some of the features of the Brazilian health system that allows us to call it a pluralized and a participatory system. Uh, Brazil is uh, a large country, but when compared with India, it uh, has a very small population, 218 million inhabitants. Uh, we are a federal system like uh, South Africa and India, and we expect to have a cooperative uh, health um, federation where states and municipalities work together. So in the map, you can see our 26 states. We have one federal district that is Brasilia and 5,575 municipalities. And they are expected uh, to work together uh, to offer social policies. Uh, this is just to give a very quick idea about uh, our health system. It is evolving. We have a national uh, health system. I will speak more. Uh, but here you have the infant mortality rates per thousand inhabitants in 2000 and 2020. And as you can see, there were improvements. Uh, today we have uh, nearly less than 15 uh, deaths per thousand uh, million or billion <laughs> thousand births. Uh, but they are very uh, unequal distribution of these deaths by social groups. So indigenous in 2010, indigenous groups had a much uh, larger um, rate uh, of deaths and this is uh, infant, this is till today. No? Here we are presenting 2010, this is our last uh, census. No? Uh, as I said, uh, municipalities, states and the federal government are expected uh, to work together. And so the Ministry of Health is responsible for articulating policy guidelines and coordinating the system. While median and high complex services are delivered by states and municipalities. And municipalities are responsible for primary care. And 
they uh, pay for the system together. You know, they co-finance the system and the federal government uh, co-financed nearly 50% of expenditures. So it has some voice in uh, the decisions about the guidelines of the system. Um, we have a very uh, interconnected system between the public and the private. So that we have a strong public system and we also have a strong private system. Uh, the public system is a national system that has some kinds of coordination and I will speak a bit about them. And the private sector uh, also grew a lot in the country and grew uh, offering services to uh, the private sector and also to the public sector. Uh, both are very heterogeneous. You have very good services and very full services in the public and the private systems. Um, and they both are very important. So they make up 9.4% uh, of Brazilian GDP, but while 55% of the money comes from the private sector, only 45% comes from the public system. And the public system covers 70% of the population, while the, public, uh, the private system only covers 30%. You know. uh, but not only they work together in offering services, having some different kinds of contracts, but they also have, we have a backstage you know, of medical schools and hand industry and research that are both public and private. You know, so we have medical schools, we have nearly 2.6 physicians uh, per thousand inhabitants in the country, that's not bad, but they are very uh, heterogeneous, very badly distributed around the country. You know. Um, and uh, in the public sector, nearly 20% goes uh, to primary care, while the other 50% goes to immediate and high complex uh, services. So uh, let me speak a little bit about the public system and what is plural in this system. You know? uh, we have a national system that grew uh, in the last 30 years. And when I speak about a national system, we could speak about a number of different features. For example, we have a pri uh, primary care system that all cities in the countries, big, uh, small, rural areas, urban areas, would follow the same guidelines. You know? uh, we have a data system that is also national uh, and we can access the system and, and municipalities and States uh, send information for this system as the federal government uh, will only transfer the money to the states and municipalities if they comply with the system. And we have a very strong uh, national vaccination system you know, that was very important during COVID. Um, it's a quite complex system because you need to bring together political and clinical authorities. And we have developed a number of different mechanisms to uh, allow this governance and one of them are the participatory mechanisms you know, that uh, we are all very interested in this project. Uh, Brazil has a strong uh, system for uh, participation in, in health so that municip all 5,570 uh, municipalities will have a health council. Then you have a council at the state level and uh, all 27 states have uh, these councils and one federal council, national council. Um, the, we, we call councillors, but uh, really we could uh, call them committee members. The committee members, uh, participatory committee uh, members are elected at each two years uh, and the procedures are different, but they are not nominated by the government. They, there is a process of uh, choosing uh, these representatives. Uh, they are political forums in the sense that uh, um, they take decisions about plans and budgets, not too much, but some decisions, and they approve plans and budgets. You know? And in these uh, committees, we have 50% of representatives of civil society, 25 of providers, and 25 of uh, 
um, providers, uh, public officials. So 25, 25 and 50. Uh, we have also uh, built a number of clinical coordination mechanisms. I won't speak about them. But what's important, we have contracts uh, inside the public sector so with the private sector to deliver public services. But we also have contracts between the federal, the states and the municipalities. And this also helps a lot the system to work. Um, going to the end, uh, this is an example of what we are calling here the resilient national uh, system. This is uh, the expand uh, the distribution of uh, primary care through Brazil. So it's a national program. Uh, the coverage is high, about 86% or more in the country. And uh, during implementation, the priority was given to poor locations and poor uh, populations inside big cities. And uh, during this last 30 years, uh, SUS achieved some important results in terms of reducing health inequalities. So access to services uh, is much less unequal today. Uh, there's a decrease in inequalities in vaccination coverage. Nearly 100% of births took place at health institutions. And the rate of hospitalizations related to causes sensitive to primary care dropped more than for other causes. And what's very important, dropped more uh, among the black population than among the white population, what also means a reduction in inequalities. So uh, after 30 years of having uh, building the SUS, this is the Brazilian public health care system, we are optimists because the SUS had made achievements. Uh, the SUS was recognized by the population as important in tackling COVID. And now uh, we believe that politically it will also uh, receive much more support as a national policy. So very briefly, I think this gives an idea about the SUS. So let's go to India. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming on today to listen to all of us in our country context and the work that we will do. By the way, the name on the slide is Prasanna, but this is Vinod. Uh, Prasanna's colleague will be presenting on behalf of the Indian team. Um, so one of the things that, um, you know, captures the attention when we look at India is it's very complex governance system. Um, and it's complex not just because of the way in which the governance systems are structured at different levels of geography, but also because of the fact that they can be controlled by different political parties at the same time. Um, and that has a deep bearing on the way in which, um, you know, any kind of public system delivery is made. So uh, on the slide, you can see that we have a very federal system of governance. So it's India, it's called as the Union of States. Um, you have, so there are functions when it comes to health, we have functions at the union government or the national government level. There are functions that uh, the state governments are to be doing, and there are about 20, 28 states, 28 or sometimes 29, because one is a state as well as union territory. But anyway, so there are these different states and each state has a set of health functions. You have the union government and that has a set of health functions. And there are some health functions which are um, falling in the concurrent list as per the constitution, which means both union and state kind of share uh, responsibilities um, in delivering that function. You can see that on the screen. Um, and like I said, each of these could be manned by um, or guarded by political parties that can be completely in opposition to each other. And so the um, kind of control and the power devolution that happens within these structures has a bearing on the way in the way in which public services are made. 
Um, we did have a constitutional amendment, which is called the 73rd and the 74th Constitutional Amendment, which said uh, about devolving powers to municipal bodies and panchayats. Panchayats are um, the local self-governance systems within rural areas and municipal bodies are the bodies, um, uh, governance bodies um, at uh, city levels. Um, and health is largely a state subject. So, uh, uh, and whether it, it is completely a state subject or whether there is a concurrence between the state and the union and what functions a municipality performs, you can see that um, there's a division across the different, uh, different uh, the, there is a division across all of them and can be quite confusing. Uh, but largely that's what you see on the slide. Um, so just to give you another context of how the um, structures of health systems delivery are complex, what you can see in the next two slides, I'm not going to go through all of them, but just to give you an idea of how there are different ministries and there are different um, councils, there are different missions um, and there are different uh, bodies that control or kind of um, govern the certain aspects of health functions, uh, populations, etc. Um, so, and then if you see this slide that I'm sharing right now, you can see the kind of flows of power and decision making that goes across the three different levels of um, you know, geographic level. So union is at the country level, state is at the state level. And each state is divided into several districts. And so there's a district level um, health systems function that happens. And um, it, as an example, if you look at um, the national health mission, um, goes to the state health society and directly goes into the district health society. And the flows, the different flows kind of interconnect in such a way that um, there can often be, uh, you know, no clear um, sort of um, transfer of roles and responsibilities across that matches with the kind of decision making power that these different institutions have. Um, and also, uh, we didn't put a slide, but just to let you know that the um, there have been certain taxation system changes in our country in the past couple of years. And a substantial amount of um, taxes um, are now directly going to the union or the national government. And then it is up to the national government to make remits to the state uh, for the share of taxes that are coming from the state. And there's a nasty calculation that looks at different parameters. Um, uh, and, and that's why you see that the um, states themselves sometimes may be uh, you know, cash strapped in order to even perform the functions that they need to do. And the devolution of power from the state to municipalities as well has um, not necessarily happened in all cities. So you see cities like, for example, in the Indian context, we will be working in Mumbai and Bangalore. And these cities, to a large extent, are able to generate their own revenue and able to perform a lot of functions because they have access to money. Uh, but that's not necessarily the same with many other city contexts and municipalities that are able to generate their own money. So the question of um, you know, efficient uh, provision of health services at the local level is certainly something that uh, we need to think about. Um, to give you an overview of what participatory health governance systems even exist, um, it, there are a couple at the, uh, there are a couple of them. At the, we're just putting up what is there at the, at the urban level. Um, what you have is a hospital management committee, so called as Rogi Kalyan Samitis, and um, they have a set of people elected from different um, or selected from different institutions and uh, structured to do it. But largely, the um, sort of what we call as the Mahila Arogya Samiti or the women. Um, they, they have the women, uh, women, women um, health workers who are um, local women's collectives that are supposed to promote community participation, health planning, implementing, monitoring of programs. Um, though there are a lot of challenges that um, are embedded within these systems. Um, and um, I think there are these different axes of inquiry that we would like to do 
as a part of this. So just to give you a brief of um, what we plan to do within this project is um, it, it's that now, now if you look at the whole structure that we presented, it is plural, but at the same time, it's not plural. It could be said as not plural because of the sort of, um, you know, the it's not integrating towards kind of one uh, form of um, health systems delivery. So while we are looking at, um, while the implementation of uh, community participation uh, is more effective at the very decentralized local level, we see that the devolution of powers themselves have not happened in the way in which it should be. So how much of um, community groups at a local level will even of decision making that happens at the local level is sort of a question. So there is a need for us to even evaluate these current structures and uh, the way in which these structures function. There's also a lot of contracting that happens in terms of health systems delivery and like many other countries, NGOs uh, normally apply for uh, uh, aspects of health system delivery, um, like maternal and child care, for example, is given out. And there's a need to understand the mechanism in which this is all done and where community participation and in what forms do that those systems elicit community participation. Um, and of course, um, one is looking at this exist these existing systems and um, understand if there are ways to strengthen them or to even look at the flaws within those systems. For example, many of these systems put a lot of burden on women and is very women centric and does look at um, things like um, are largely limited to women's health and uh, maternal health, maternal and child health. They're not looking at many other different aspects. Um, so that needs to be looked at. And then we plan to use tracers, um, which kind of helps uh, for uh, more focus inquiry and assessment. Um, and of course, um, uh, we plan to pilot um, some sort of participatory model at a very local level and learn from its implementation. Uh, that's it from me. Thank you so much. I do invite Hani to come and present on the South African context. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. So I am presenting on behalf of the South African team. And since you all, I assume, know the South African health system, my presentation will focus uh, on, on participatory systems. And it's obviously in the context of the country moving towards uh, the national health insurance implementation. So basically, my presentation is divided into two. First, I'll look at what spaces for participation and social accountability we currently have and what spaces there are in the national health insurance and more specifically in the bill since we we haven't really started implementation and based on on the comparison between these two uh, we'll ask some critical questions around participation in a health system guided by the national health insurance so for some of you this will probably not be new but these are some of the spaces we currently have for participation we have health committees sometimes called clinic committees and these are structures that consist at a local level they're linked to facilities and they are constituted by the facility man manager a local government uh, councillor and community representatives uh, we also have hospital boards or health facility boards, and also here we have community representatives. Then we have district health councils. Uh, we don't know much about how they are composed, but uh, mainly uh, according to legislation, it, they are composed of people with sort of technical skills. But there are left spaces for what's called additional members, and in some districts, uh, such as the uh, Cape Metro, uh, two seats, seats are given to community representatives. 
Then we're supposed to have provincial health councils. And again, here there are spaces for additional persons which could be community representative. Now you heard in the Brazilian system where they have a system of councils that goes from the very local to the very top with a community representation. Uh, in our national health council, there's no representation of communities. And more importantly, in particularly if you compare to Brazil, is that there, there are no uh, articulation or representation between the different structures. What we do know about implementation is that it is very uneven. And that's all I'm going to say about implementation. There are a few other spaces in the current health system that leave space for participation. And one of them is uh, national core standards. And I think what's interesting about the national core standards is that that's actually the standard that the Office of Health Service Compliances will use to um, to accredit a health establishment for the national health insurance. Uh, and and uh, national core standards obviously involve a internal assessment that the facilities do and then make plan for improvement and then an external uh, assessment which will either lead to accreditation or to, to requirements for uh, improvements. Uh, the national health, uh, uh, the national core standards involves a number of domains, uh, and I have chosen to pull out one domain, domain four for public health. I'm not going to go through it, just to to ask you to look at point four one one, which says that communities, as well as other government departments and sectors, are involved in the planning and delivery of local health services. So in the national core standards, which is the system that's used to accredit facilities, public and private, under the national health insurance, we have a requirement that communities are involved in planning and delivery of local health services. Obviously, uh, it just says communities. It doesn't say whether that's health committees or other structures. We also have in South Africa the ideal clinic management uh, process. And, and as you know, there's again a number of, I think, 236 elements in the ideal clinic, and there's a number of checklists of things that are required for a clinic to achieve ideal clinic status. And again, I'm not going to go through the entire checklist for, for health committees, but there is a, a, a checklist for, here they call them clinic committees. So there is a requirement to become an ideal clinic that you have a functional clinic committee. But what is interesting is also to look at what clinic committees are supposed to do. So for instance, there should be a list of community needs as determined by the clinic or health committee in the past 12 months. There should be minutes of clinic and health committees that indicate that statistical data on population health indicators are discussed. So that's discussed between the facility managements and the committee. In a similar way, uh, the facility and the committees should discuss human resources and equipment. And finally, there should be evidence that clinic committees or health committees are involved in uh, or at least informed about complaint management. So this slide just reflect on, on uh, the extent to which there are community involvement in the national cost and this in the ideal clinic. So in the national cost standards, they're supposed to be involved in planning and delivery of local health services. In the ideal clinic, there's a number of uh, things that health committees should be involved in, listing the needs of the community, discuss needs and progress against the facilities operational plans, have statistical data or discuss statistical data on population and health, discuss human resources and management of complaints with the facility manager. So in general, in those two 
documents, there's a very strong vision of a form of community participation that can be defined as participation in health governance, which is what this project is interested in. We also have a national complaint management system, which is an accountability system. And uh, as you know, uh, there are complaint boxes in uh, most facilities. Uh, according to the national guidelines on how complaints should be managed, uh, a community member could potentially serve on the complaint management committee but there's no requirement that, that there is a community representative. However, the guideline does state that the monthly and quarterly report on complaints should be submitted to the Community Health Forum. And again, confusion of terms. A Community Health Forum is the same in this context as a clinic committee or a health uh, committee. So they should discuss that with the management. Uh, so that's... Uh, the uh, guideline, uh, in reality, we do know that many health committees are involved in complaint, complaint management as, and as we have seen, the ideal clinic also make it a requirement. So that's sort of uh, the participatory structures and the opportunity or spaces for engagement and participation currently. Then, as you know, we are moving towards the, the national health insurance, towards a plural health system where we'll have the public health system and we'll have a private health system that is uh, contracted to, live, to deliver health services. So, in the national health insurance, uh, I've again looked at spaces for partic community participation. So the board, which is sort of the highest decision-making uh, body for the national health in insurance, here members are appointed after public nomination. And lastly, that's people with a range of technical skills in public health, in maybe accounting, in epidemiology, etc. There's no representation of users or, or patients or participatory structures. Then there's a benefit advisory committee, which is the, the committee that will make decisions around what kind of services the national health insurance will cover. Again, uh, it is mostly technical skills, though it also says that someone with skills in rights of patients should be uh, part of the committee. But who should, uh, who has the expertise to, to uh, represent patients' rights. There's nothing about that. Then there's an uh, a stakeholder advisory committee. Again, mainly technical skills, but interestingly, here uh, civil society organizations and patient advocacy groups are represented. So it's sort of a bit difficult to see why we have civil society represented on the stakeholder advisory committee, but not on the benefit advisory committee. Uh, at local level, at the primary health healthcare level, uh, we have contracting units which are going to manage the provision of uh, primary healthcare in an area. <coughs> and these units are composed of district hospitals, clinics, ward-based outreach team, and private providers. There's a number of duties, and I have listed them uh, some of them only, there's a long list. So these contracted units should identify healthcare needs, identify accredited public and private providers, manage contracts, improve access to healthcare services and facilities in the community, and resolve complaints. And as you can see, there's some overlap with the role health committees in public facilities currently uh, should have. There is no participation in at this level, though um, one could ask whether this wouldn't be an ideal space for participation of structures such as health committees. The national health insurance and accountability. So general complaints about the national health insurance will be handled by the CEO and an investigating investigating unit. At local level, complaints will be managed by the contract unit. Uh, 
Then if people are not happy with uh, how complaints are managed, they can go to the appeal tribunal. And again, we have a similar composition, people with uh, technical knowledge and no representation by patients and users. In terms of if you compare the accountability system in the national health uh, insurance with the national health guide, it's very interesting that there is no redress. So a very important component and the, of the current national guideline on how to manage complaints is that there must be redress. And the second important component in the national guideline is that that you should follow trends of complaints so they can be used to improve uh, services and rectify shortcomings in the system. So it seems like a much weaker accountability system. So some of the critical issues, I think, is sort of comparison between the current system and what is in the National Health Act raises is whether we'll still have participants structures in public facilities and will there be some form of participation in private healthcare provision and if so what for? How will legislation and policies be aligned? So obviously uh, the national health insurance is a financing mechanism. It doesn't do away with things like the National Health Act where health committees get their mandate from. So how are these policies going to be aligned? How is the complaint system going to be aligned, for instance, with the national uh, complaints guideline, etc.? And how will uh, the state's human rights obligation to participation be realized in the national health insurance? Uh, finally, there's an issue around the whole contract process, will there be an obligation of participation in that contracting process? So, so will there be an accountability mechanism built into the contracting process when we come private sector to deliver healthcare? So that's the thoughts on the South African system. And now I think we have questions and comments. I think Leslie will manage that. Thanks, Hannah, and thanks to all the speakers. Uh, we lost a bit of time, so unfortunately we don't have a lot of time now, but we have a few moments for uh, questions. I see Zianda. Welcome, Zianda. Over to you. Are you able to unmute? Zianda, you're still muted. Your hands are up. Oh, thank you, Prof. Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm sorry, I can't switch on my camera. Um, I have load shading this night. I just wanted to just uh, add a comment um, with regards to the work of the Office of Health Standards Compliance. Uh, and just to say in this forum that the national core standards um, were standards that were used by the National Department of Health prior to the establishment of the Office of Health Standards Compliance uh, Office. So we do have a set of standards which are based on the norms and standards regulations and particularly um, the aspect that deals with the clinic committee is quite comprehensive where it is quite compulsory for every health establishment to have a clinic committee in place that will look at the complaints and look at the statistical data and all of that. So I could share a copy of those um, with you. Thank you so much, Prof. That will be very helpful. I wonder if you want to comment on the efforts of the office to uh, audit private sector hospitals or private facilities, because I know that's been a challenge. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, it indeed has been a challenge, but we have begun to start uh, to we have begun inspecting the private sector. What the strategy is that uh, we are now inspecting the hospitals first while we are finalizing the inspection tools for the for the GPS. So that is already under underway. But you are right. I mean, capacity wise, we are struggling. And um, we are finding, we are trying to explore different means within which to realize that. Thank you so much. Okay, let's try again. So I think we had a little internet blip. Are there any other comments or questions? Anybody wants to raise anything? I'm, well, 
I'm looking at the chat. Uh, okay, Virginia froze, but you should be back now, Virginia. Uh, okay, and Siki, I don't know if you, well, you were talking about the Brazilian context. Uh, yes, I was. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think there's been a lot uh, of effort in trying to see what the others are doing, but that is not uh, translated uh, into realistic uh, patient outcomes. Mm. Mm. Okay, any other comments or questions? I see Opa. Yes, over to you. Um, thanks, Leslie. I just wanted to make a, a comment in terms of um, community participation at, at operational level. There has been one of the challenges that we've been facing is um, that in many instances, the community representatives in the health committees who are officially appointed um, are not necessarily recognized or favored by the communities. And then you actually have community representatives who are recognized and favored by the communities, but not recognized officially as community representatives. And sometimes you get these contestations between what the, com the communities would call community health forums and what we call um, health committees, which are separate entities. So that also creates some complexities um, when you try to um, operationalize community participation within the, the legislative framework that we have currently. Yeah, it's a good point. And I think on our visits to Cliffrontine and Kailiche yesterday, that came out very clearly in the discussions. So thanks for raising that. Uh, any other comments or questions? We are at one o'clock. So unless there's any other comments. Um, uh, yes, there's another hand, which is uh, Lumka. Um, good afternoon, uh, Doc. Um, I just want um, uh, to know if is it possible to share the the, the, the presentation um, with us because there has been communication um, or connection glitches here and there. So if it's possible to share the the, the presentation yeah. with us so that we can uh, listen to it after. Sure. I think uh, it's been recorded. At least 47 minutes of it have been recorded. Uh, so that will be available on our website and we can make available the uh, presentations. We will have a website for the project, COMPLUS. Uh, so these presentations will be available. And I should also draw your attention to the fact we're having an official launch at 4.30 this afternoon at the Francis Ames seminar room here on Health Science Campus, which hopefully will not be interrupted by load shedding. Uh, and that will also be recorded and available afterwards. So, so all the discussions should be available. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other questions, requests, comments? I don't know if anybody on the team wants to chip in anything. Otherwise, I think we're going to close off. Thanks, everybody. It's just after one. Thanks for your patience. And uh, I can't really apologize for ESCOM because we were in everything. And hopefully we'll see you at the launch this afternoon. Uh, and thanks for the contributions. Much appreciated. Bye then. We can clap. <laughs>